This right here is Hello Kitty, and this right here is Drake. I will consider these two to be pop culture icons, but it isn't just their relevancy and their cultural prominence that they have in common. Both Drake and Hello Kitty have both had blackface scandals. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about Hello Kitty, Drake, their blackface scandals, and the lasting impact of blackface in America. So if you're interested in that topic, keep on watching. Hi guys, welcome and welcome back to Ella Pastoral. If this is your first time ever coming upon this channel right here, Typically, I talk about all of my favorite pieces of media, and as you guys saw by the intro and the thumbnail, today we're going to be talking about Blackface, Drake, and Hello Kitty. But before I can really talk about what the hell happened that led to little old Hello Kitty and problematic Drake doing Blackface, we need to be on the same page on what Blackface is. According to Miriam Webster, Blackface is defined as Dark makeup worn as by a performer in a minstrel show in a caricature of the appearance of a black person or a performer wearing such makeup. Blackface has and will continue to have a problematic and controversial history in American pop culture. Blackface was originally shown in minstrel shows, a type of entertainment that was very prominent in the 1800s where white performers would take shoe shine makeup, put it on their face in order to portray really racist and problematic stereotypes of black people for the sake of making white people laugh and hee hee. The portrayal of black people as seen in minstrel shows were extremely problematic and the ramifications of these problematic portrayals of black people are still felt to this very day. According to the article, this is why blackface is offensive by Hamat Korar. Blackface isn't just about painting one skin darker or putting on a costume. It invokes a racist and painful history. The origins of blackface date back to the minstrel shows of the mid 19th century. White performers darkened their skin with polish and quirk, put on tattered clothing, and exacerbated their features to look stereotypically black. The first minstrel shows mimics enslaved Africans on southern plantations, depicting black people as lazy, ignorant, cowardly or hypersexual according to the smithsonian's national museum of african-american history and culture the performers were intended to be funny to white audiences but to the black community they were demeaning and hurtful one of the most popular blackface character was jim crow developed by the performer and playwright thomas dortmouth Wright. as part of a traveling solo act rice wore a burnt cork blackface mask and raggedy clothing spoke in stereotypical black vernacular and performed a caricature song and dance routine that he said he learned from a slave according to the University of South Florida Library. Though early minstrel shows started in New York, they quickly spread to audiences in both the North and South. By 1845, minstrel shows spawned their own industry. According to the NMAAHC, its influence extended into the 20th century. Al Johnson performed in Blackface and the Jazz Singer, a hit film in 1927, and American actors like Shirley Temple, Judy Garland, and Mickey Rooney put on Blackface in movies too. The characters were so pervasive that even some black performers put on Blackface, historians say. It was the only way they could work, as white audiences weren't interested in watching black actors do anything but act foolish on stage. And what made this whole situation so sad and disappointing is that during the 18 hundreds black people literally had no rights no economic rights no social rights no rights period and so when all of this nonsense was going on and these minstrel shows were literally the hottest form of entertainment black people would literally have no recourse they would have to see themselves being portrayed as ghetto lazy ignorance even though black people were literally the only reason why the u.s economy was flourishing because of the cheap labor that they were doing right and even though people love to pretend that history has no impact on our day-to-day -day lives the history and legacy of blackface still affects us in the 21st century and even though minstrel shows and blackface as it was popular in the 1800s has faded into obscurity we still feel the lasting impacts of blackface to this very day it was only what 2008 where everyone's favorite actor robert downing jr someone who is held as like one of the best actors in hollywood did blackface and i'm not talking about like light light blackface like homeboy was doing blackface like he was doing hardcore blackface on our very very screens and it's literally so disappointing because blackface and the negative portrayal of black people that follows the legacy of blackface can still be very much felt in today's America. And I just wanted to pull up some statistics, right? Because even though it's like 2023, a lot of people still think it's okay to do blackface. According to the article, about a third of Americans 
say blackface in a Halloween costume is acceptable by Anna Brown. A slight majority of Americans, 53%, think it's generally unacceptable for a white person to use makeup to darken their skin to appear to be a different waist as a part of a Halloween costume, including 37% who say that it is never acceptable. About one in three, 34%, say that this is always or sometimes acceptable, according to a recent Pure Research Center survey. And personally for me, I want to dress up as a fairy or maybe even a witch for Halloween. But y'all want to be racist for Halloween. And I just think that puts us on two different playing fields. So that's why when people are in my comments like, oh, all this history stuff that you stay bringing up in your videos is so irrelevant. I have to look at them sideways because history doesn't suddenly stop affecting us even though it happened so and so years ago. One in three Americans think that it's okay to do blackface. And they think it's always acceptable or sometimes acceptable. Huh? We, we will never be free, Lord. <laughs> because why are you doing blackface? At the time of this article, it was 2019. So one year before COVID started hip-hopping and killing people, right? So imagine you looking at yourself and instead of choosing a very cool, very fresh costume, you're like, let me be racist. So this whole idea of blackface being a thing of the past is literally a lie. And the fact that one in three Americans think it's okay to do blackface is outlandish to me, right? Because even though continually black people will tell us how how negatively blackface and the characteristics that come with blackface are negatively impacting the black community, one in three Americans are like, let me get that shoe shine. Let me get that shoe shine in order to ridicule and make fun of black people because you're not doing blackface because you think it's cute you're doing blackface in order to ridicule and mock black people and the fact that the united states is a cultural juggernaut even makes this situation worse because <laughs> we take these ideals put them in our movies our tv shows even our songs and due to the fact that america and americans are so influential we send out our culture to other countries right and these people who have let's say never seen black people will internalize these ideas that black people are aggressive, violent, hypersexual. You've seen how blackface is portrayed, right? Lazy, all of that. And then people believe that black Americans specifically are all these things. And that's how we get involved in nonsense that we shouldn't be in. Like, black Americans are always being talked about so negatively across the world. And that's why when I was doing research about Hello Kitty, because I wanted to do a cute little Hello Kitty video, I found out about freaking Sambo Hello Kitty. And I know with the bastardization of the word wolf, conservatives have tricked us into believing that it is currently a utopia for all diverse groups in terms of representation on the TV screen. But I'm here to tell you right now, if you look at the long history of film and TV in the United States, it's only now that we're starting to get a little something something for marginalized groups. The fact that blackface is still common and the fact that one in three Americans believe that blackface is all cool and dandy shows us that we got a lot to work on in terms of actually being a progressive society that conservatives are shaking in their boots, you know, trying to imagine. And a great example of how we have blackface in popular culture is this whole Sambo Hello Kitty thing. But before I can talk about this Sambo Hello Kitty thing, I need us all to understand what Hello Kitty as a brand is. So for all of you guys who don't really know about all of the lore and stuff that comes with Hello Kitty, I'm just going to give you guys a quick recap so we can all be Hello Kitty... I don't know, Hello Kitty scholars. Hello Kitty is made by the group known as Sanrio in Japan. The Sanrio Group is a Japanese entertainment company and it designs, licenses, and produces products focusing on the kawaii, cute segments of Japanese pop culture. Their products include stationery, school supplies, gifts, and accessories, which are sold worldwide, including as specialty brand retail stores in Japan. Sanrio's best known character is Hello Kitty, a cartoon cat and one of the most successful market brands in the world. Hello Kitty, also known by her real name, Kitty White, is a fictional character created by Yuko Shimitsu, currently designed by Yuko Yamaguchi and owned by the Japanese group known as Sanrio. Sanrio depicts Hello Kitty as an amalgamized version of a white cat with a red bow and no visible mouth. According to her backstory, she lives in London with her family and is close to her twin sister Mimi who is depicted with a yellow bow. Hello Kitty was created in 1974 and the first item of vinyl corn purse was introduced in 1975. Originally, Hello Kitty was only marketed towards pre-teenage girls. But beginning in the 1990s, the brand found commercial 
commercial success among teenage and adult consumers as well. Hello Kitty's popularity also grew with the emergence of kawaii Q culture. The brand went into decline in Japan after the 1990s but continued to grow in the international market. By 2010, the character was worth $5 billion a year and the New York Times called her a global marketing phenomenon. By 2014, when Hello Kitty was 40 years old, she was worth about $8 billion a year. Like, I cannot understand how popular and influential the Hello Kitty brand is. Like, I live in America and I even know about Hello Kitty. In fact, I love Hello Kitty. That's why I was like, I have to tell my little subscribers about this because I have so many Hello Kitty themed things and I never knew that Hello Kitty did blackface. I literally have these stickers on my iPad that I'm reading off my script for. So imagine me and how shocked I was when I found out that Hello Kitty did blackface that one time. And so seeing as how Hello Kitty has taken over America, I want to talk about the one time where Hello Kitty and American values clashed. And this is when we had the introduction of the two blackface Hello Kitties, as I'm going to call them for this video. Sambo and Hannah. Sambo and Hannah debuted alongside Bambina in issue number 216 of Strawberry News in January 1986, where chocolates in the shape of Sambo and Hannah's faces were sold as Valentine's Day products of that year. The packaging for the chocolates featured early design differences such as Sambo's pants being white and Hannah's dress having a white collar on it. Their designs were originally based on the children's book, The Story of Little Black Sambo, which is beloved in Japan and is now widely considered controversial there. Other characters like Madonna and Kowani, later named Alfalfa, were added to the cast after Sambo and Hannah's debut. Sambo and Hannah quickly grew in popularity, which resulted in more merchandise being made. The characters making regular appearances in Strawberry News to the point of even making the cover of one issue and an animated OVA film being considered in 1988, the same year their fame would turn into controversy. In July 1988, Sambo and Hannah merchandise received international outrage when the Washington Post carried a story describing the popularity in Japan of black hair based on Little Black Sambo and mentioning Sambo and Hannah and Bambina in the article. At first, Sanrio attempted to defend the line with spokesman Kenchiro Ide saying that Sambo and Hannah merchandise was popular with children, much like Bambina, and they enjoy it with goodwill. They will not grow up to be racist. A Sanrio representative in an interview with the American press stated, everyone thought that the Sambo goods were cute. We didn't think they were discriminatory. Another spokesman, Kazo Tamuso, said that Sambo and Hannah were designed to be kawaii cute. The outrage caused the Sambo and Hannah lines production to be halted and merchandise was recalled from 3,000 of Sanrio's boutiques throughout Japan at a cost of 15 million. But Sanrio would later do more than just discontinue Sambo and Hannah items, as well as doing the same for other problematic characters sold at the time, such as Bunchaka and Bambina. Juan Yakabayashi, the then director of, of the Japanese American Citizens League, began getting furious calls from black citizens, including one caller threatening to circulate racist Japanese caricatures as retaliation. After so many threatening calls, Yabayazi called Sanrio to tell them what was happening. To his surprise, Sanrio responded in a way unimaginable for a Japanese firm. It swiftly responded. From there, an unusual collaboration began between a Japanese corporation and Japanese American civil rights leaders to help Sanrio launch a widely heralded program of corporate damage control. A Children's Day festival took place that fell at Loyola Mormont University in California to share Japanese culture with black children while also tackling the problem of cultural ignorance through activities with the black community. Sanrio maintained that it was unaware of Sambo and Hannah's racist implication by publishing a six-part series in Strawberry News to teach Japanese youth about America's ethnic diversity. Sanrio company officials would later invite several black children to Japan as a part of its Little Ambassadors program. Sanrio executives met with the members of the Congressional Black Caucus in November that year to propose a $257,000 
toy distribution to poor children in San Francisco, California through its American branch, then called Sanrio Toy Company as a further apology for selling the controversial Sambo and Hannah line. The way the Sanrio group was able to handle this whole blackface Hello Kitty scandal has been one of the best PR moves that I have ever seen in a long time. They addressed the problem, talked to the people that it affected, and tried to build a bridge between the groups that perpetuated the nonsense and the groups that were affected. We don't see PR moves like this now in the 21st century. And even though I really feel like the San Real group was able to handle the whole blackface Hello Kitty debacle quick, quick, and fast, fast, right? The fact that millions of children were able to see a blackface Hello Kitty in the first place is wild. But at least the San Real group was able to listen to the complaints and you know impact that the blackface hello kitty had on billions of black people and actively did something about it um we can learn from the San Rio group because even in america where blackface originated and was prominent for years via minstrel shows we like to pretend that blackface and its impacts are no longer relevant it was only 2008 that i told y'all that Mr. Iron Man himself was doing blackface. And like I said before, one third of Americans think it's always okay to do blackface. But I'm not going to do too much on Miss Little Hello Kitty, right? Because it isn't just Hello Kitty that has been doing blackface. We need to talk about Drake. I don't know what it is about blackface that has our culture in such a chokehold, but literally people love, love, love to do blackface. I just find it so wild in the year of our Lord 2023, we can actively still find blackface. The examples that I'm going to talk about aren't specifically from 2023, but they are from the era of social media. Because as long as we have social media and I can still find these pictures on Google, I'm going to have my foots on your neck when you guys do problematic stuff. Period. If you guys are on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, any of these social media sites during Halloween, you know you'll catch at least one person doing a little one two one two blackface situation, right? Like I said, I want to dress up as a cute little fairy princess. But y'all want to dress up as a racist for Halloween and I find that so wild. And when people do blackface, it's never ever at the expense of light-skinned individuals. Personally, in my experience, I never find people doing blackface in the terms of mocking a black person who has the complexion of Doja Cat or even Drake in this situation. It's always blackface that relates to someone of a darker skin complexion. Like, when I tell you guys colorism is also a factor in this, I'm not joking. But it isn't just white people who be doing blackface. Black people be doing blackface too. And that's when i be the most shocked because as a black person you should know the ramifications of blackface on our culture on our psyches and how much blackface has affected us but for some reason you're doing blackface like why and the person who i'm bringing here to accuse of nonsense and crimes against the black community has to be mr aubrey graham himself mr lover boy mr girls love drake himself drake like guys, I really thought that Pusha T did a Photoshop type situation when this picture was released as his little Drake diss. But when Drake himself confirmed, yeah, it was him who did blackface, I physically screamed. Because for what reason is light skinned Drake doing blackface? Because now I think about it. When Drake said, yeah, I'm light skinned, but I'm still a dark he must have felt that spiritually and he must have thought about that time he did blackface because he was talking about some guys. I, I, the reason why I did blackface is to show that, you know, black people are not being treated seriously in the acting world. And in my head, I was like, there was no other reason. There was no other way you could have done that because I can think of some quick, quick instead of doing blackface. But that's just me because I'm sorry. I have to let you guys really sit with this picture because this picture is literally scarred in my mind like whenever my friends say anything about drake i'm like mr blackface himself and then the whole chat gets quiet because i can't let him live this down there are other light-skinned black people who have done blackface too because like i said blackface is mostly done at the expense of dark-skinned individuals i have yet to see blackface done to be made fun of you know lighter-skinned individuals it's always like a hardcore dig 
at dark skinned people. The next person who I'm bringing to the accusation stand for nonsense against black people most definitely has to be the actress who played Gamora in the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. I don't know guys, I find it awfully suspicious that I'm two for one for MCU stars that have done blackface in the past, but I digress. The person who I want to accuse is Madame Gamora herself and the reason behind her blackface was even worse than Drake because at least for Drake he's just a clown. Like we look at Drake and his problematic everything and we can just be like boo boo shame on Drake shame on Drake but before this situation I thought Madame Gamora was cool so the reason why Madame Gamora was even doing blackface was for a movie about Nina Simone can y'all believe that can y'all believe that um, I know y'all always joke about what if we made a white person MLK what if they made a light-skinned person Nina Simone Nina Simone was like a very talented person um, I'm gonna insert a picture right here um, this is what she looked like Mm -hmm. This is what Madame Gamora looks like. For some reason, I don't know if it's because like she was like an MCU queen and they were like, we have to have Gamora in this movie. But instead of hiring like a monoracial black person who has features similar, I didn't say the exact features, but similar to Nina Simone, they decided that the best course would be to take Miss Gamora herself and give her prosthetics and then darken her skin. Let's just have a moment of silence. <laughs> Lord have mercy, because what possessed y'all to think that this was okay? And then Miss Gamora herself got mad when the entire black community was like, we're not watching this awful, awful movie. Would you? Would you? Goodness gracious, it was bad, guys. I gotta put this side by side. Let's have another moment of silence. Do I have to explain? Yeah. That's why I feel like when I say blackface is still killing us, what led y'all to the situation? Because instead of giving a dark skinned person with like Afrocentric features, big nose, big lips, right? A platform, a chance to shine in this Nina Simone. I think it was like a documentary or a biopic. I forgot what the exact term is when you make a movie about someone's life. Y'all decided to practically let Madame Gamora herself do blackface. But in this new day and age, hardcore blackface like the one that Robert Downey Jr. did and the way uh, Miss Gamora herself did really isn't fashionable. People typically, people with sense typically give you the side eye when you do something like that. So blackface has evolved into something I like to call blackfishing. And just to make sure we're on the same page, I wanna give you a definition of what blackfishing is. According to what blackfishing means and why people do it by Faith Kamarabi, CNN's was blackfishing. The term came to prominence in a Twitter thread two years ago when journalist Wanda Thompson said she noticed white celebrities and influencers cosplaying as black women on social media. Blackfishing is when white public figures influencers and the like do everything in their power to appear black thompson told cnn this week whether that means to tan their skin excessively in an attempt to achieve ambiguity and wear hairstyles and clothing trends that have been pioneered by black women critics have described it as a form of blackface saying it creates a dangerous paradox by celebrating black beauty and aesthetics but only when highlighted by white people instead of celebrating black culture from the sidelines there's this need to own it to participate in it without the wanting the full experience of blackness and the systematic discrimination that comes with it, Thompson said. Black fishing is way more socially acceptable than blackface with its harsh dark pigments and extremely red lips. What typically happens when someone wants to engage in black fishing is that they a darken their skin, b wear some type of hairstyle that's associated with the black community, and c use AAVE and confuse people about their ethnicity or racial identity. We see this in a lot of white women. We see this in the Kardashian clan. I talked about them a lot in my white women in black spaces video. Um, we see this with um, Rachel Dolezal. She was a white woman who for years pretended to have a black family in order to get a high position at the NAACP. Her white family had to be like, I don't know what she's talking about. She's definitely white. And we also see this phenomenon in a lot of our trashy white teen stars like Whoa Vicky as well as Daniel Bogoli. All of them use blackness in one shape or form in order to get some type of online clout or notoriety. Um, but as soon as that blackness is no longer beneficial for them, they all of a sudden start to return to their white roots. Like for example, Kim Kardashian, um, when she was married and consistently involved with black men, she would do everything in her power to push herself towards blackness, right? Um, braids, um, 
consistently tanning herself her obsession with big butts because like that is a feature that is most of the time associated with black women as soon as she and Kanye stopped having their you know marriage all of a sudden she's going for blonder looks lighter makeup looks bleached blonde eyebrows right and she even removed her um, iconic buttocks um black fishing is the new black face and even though i feel like minstrel shows and the legacy of minstrel shows have gone away um people still use black identity for jokes like so many times black women specifically will be the butt of the joke and the joke is like haha get it because she's black like all the black men that consistently do whatever this is it's literally our new uh, minstrel show we need to do better um, we need to speak up against this nonsense that way we don't have this nonsense perpetuated as the main form of comedy and entertainment like how minstrel shows were the poppin the hottest thing to watch in the 1800s and even though minstrel shows and blackface as we know it has slowly faded out of you know the common pop culture we still see is lasting legacies to this day. Blackface can still be seen in black fishing and using black people as the butt of every joke is still a thing that we see in pop culture. Whatever this is that black men love to do, we need to speak up against this so it can stop. It's really gross and I hate to see it. It literally is giving modern day minstrel shows. And whenever we see bad representation of black people, just like how they did when Sambo Hello Kitty came out, we need to use our voices and speak up against the nonsense because there's no way we just let in this nonsense lie guys like we need to do better before we end this video i want to say special thanks to all of my current patreons i want to say without you guys i wouldn't be able to make these videos now let's go to the ending of the video um if you like this video make sure that you hit the thumbs up button it really helps push this video in the algorithm also comments commenting really helps push this video in the algorithm and let me know if you knew about sambo hello kitty as well as hannah and also if you knew about drake and um madam madam gamora's blackface histories and i don't know hit the subscribe button guys that also helps this channel and i'll see you guys in the next one bye